April um, uh, next year. Um, we are going to be joined today by Bill McKibben. We don't, Bill, are you on the call? I don't think you are yet. Um, so when Bill joins us, we will uh, have a few words from him. Um, and Tobias, you reached out to Veronique, right? To make sure that we had Bill on the call. Yes. Okay. Um, well, um, in Bill's absence, let me just welcome everybody. Um, we are coming off of what will be the hottest year um, uh, that human civilization has ever experienced, um, at least in the last 10,000. Um, we're also living at a time where it seems like the fossil fuel industry has captured the COP process. Um, oil companies are bullish on their future in oil. Um, and uh, the climate movement um, is sort of struggling to come back in some ways from the pandemic. Um, uh, and so it's a time where we all need to step up. I mean, our, our motto of our program is that uh, in many ways, the biggest threat to the future of the planet is thinking that somebody else is going to lead. So I want to thank you all for the work that you're you're doing. If you're here today, that means you're all very engaged. Um, and we want to offer an, an opportunity to this community um, to help their communities um, get everybody talking about climate change. Um, and again, oh, here we go. There's Bill coming in right now. So, Bill, I think you're just joining. Waiting for Bill to get on audio. Let's see, I saw third act joining here a second ago. Folks, apologies for the technical glitches here, but um, Bill, are you with us? Oh, I know he was here a second ago. No, that third act join was third act upstate New York, not Bill. Oh, that wasn't Bill. Okay. Well, Michael, that's disappointing. <laughs> we thought you were Bill. Um, all right. Still waiting for Bill McKibben to join. Um, all right. So in Bill's absence, let's kind of move forwards with the kind of the second half of the program. Um, and when Bill joins, we'll we'll cut over to him and let him take over the call. Um, so uh, we, for the last four years, have been engaged in a global project in collaborative climate education. Last year, we ran a thing called the Teach-In on Climate Justice. Um, it involved um, 300 schools uh, around the world, about 50,000 people, 50 countries. And we're back this year for more. Um, and in particular, we're calling on all of you to get your communities involved in Worldwide Climate and Justice Education Week, which is scheduled for the first week of April, April 1st to 8th, on or around. Um, not all of you are university folks, um, but everybody knows a teacher, everybody knows a student, and in particular, everybody knows a climate-concerned student or teacher. Um, and this is just really an opportunity for us to work together, um, we're stronger together, um, and have the kind of impact that, that we need to have at this particular moment in time. Um, and um, we're calling on people to do two things um, during that first week of April. Um, and the first one is to make climate an event. So uh, this is kind of the teach-in model. We're looking for universities, high schools, middle schools uh, to um, hold what, any kind of, of kind of community gathering event um, from panel discussions to film, theater, um, games. We've got lots of options for folks. Um, and that's those are good, right? For energizing our communities and, and getting people moving forwards. Um, I attended the first Earth Day in 1970. I can still remember it. Um, and it had an impact on me because 53 years later, here I am organizing a, a global event uh, around climate change. But the second piece um, 
is that we are also calling on uh, all educators, K-12, university, and not climate experts, but just normal old educators who are increasingly climate concerned to make climate a class. Um, and this means we want, the thesis here is that every college, university, every K-12 school, there are increasing numbers of climate concerned faculty, teachers. Um, and in fact, many of them are, as are their students, kind of deep in climate despair. So how can we get people out of that mindset and into a mindset of climate repair um, and empower climate concern, but non-climate experts to talk about climate change with their students and get them excited and engaged about the possibilities of climate repair? So the idea is if you're teaching a studio art class, nothing to do with climate change, you can take a half an hour during Climate and Justice Education Week and talk about how artists are responding to climate change. Similarly, if you're teaching psychology, you can do this um, in a psychology class. Here, you can talk about climate despair. Uh, if you're teaching chemistry 101, you can talk about how chemists are addressing the issue of climate change. Um, and if you are teaching history, European history, nothing to do with climate change uh, on the face of it, but you can talk about how historians are changing the way they think about the past, the more we learn about climate. So this is an avenue for any climate concerned teacher in the world to begin to bring climate change into their classes and intellectually engage students who, as I said, are in despair and many disengaged. They feel like the issue is too big, too overdetermined, too overwhelming, but to begin to see themselves as repair people, right? Folks who, um, uh, you know, like economics, they can be a climate economist. They like music. You know, they can write climate songs. Uh, they like uh, physics. You know, there's lots of work to do in the physics space uh, for 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 in, in the climate work. And this is a marathon, not a sprint. So how do we kind of move students from that mindset of climate despair to a mindset of climate repair? Had a lot of damage to the climate, a lot of repair work to be done. How can we live our lives substantively um, doing good work? So those are the two thrusts of uh, the Worldwide Climate and Justice uh, Education Week. Um, and there's space in particular for students here to take a lead. Um, they can take the lead in organizing events on their campus. For example, we've got uh, a set of climate plays that theater groups can produce. Um, we've got a, a, a whole uh, sort of plethora of different organizing models that, that people can pick from. But students can also ask their teachers to make climate a class. Um, and they can organize other students to ask their teachers to make climate a class. And if you're a teacher and you're getting five or six or 10 students asking you to participate in this project, you're probably gonna do it. You're gonna be responsive to that. Um, so a really important role for young people um, to do this kind of work. Um, and any sign of Bill coming in, Tobias? Have you seen? We're still, him? we're still waiting. Apologies, everyone. Yeah, Sorry. this was supposed Sorry. to be not even good scene talking for the first uh, 20 or 25 minutes. Um, so uh, that is kind of, this is the second half of the show, right? This is kind of what we wanted to talk with you about. Um, and rather than kind of try and go through a PowerPoint or give you sort of more information, um, I'd love to hear someone tell me kind of why this won't work, why this is something you don't want to get involved in, or alternatively, you know, why this is something that is exciting to you, right? I would actually like to know why this is, you know, what, what would stop people, what would stop teachers, what would stop students from stepping into this, because we need it so badly. What is going on? It's the hottest year ever. The climate movement needs to be reinvigorated. How come we can't get thousands of colleges and universities and high schools participating next April? Because we're set up for that. Our platform can handle it. Um, any thoughts or comments from people? Make this participatory today. Quiet group. Um, Hello. Yes. We'll go ahead, Winnie. I, I, I'm Winnie at Bullfrog Films. Yeah. Um, we're just in the last week of a, um, a film a screening tour with a new film called The Oil Machine. 
um, shot in Scotland about North Sea oil and how we all live in the oil machine um, with many voices. Um, and booking it on college campuses, there were it's sort of the flip side of divestment. There were some colleges that were afraid of their oil funders mm -hmm. being offended. Um, I was very surprised. I thought we were way past that, but that's a possibility out there. Thank you. Um, go ahead, Seth. Hi, Eben. Um, as you know, recently there was a lot of press for climate fresk. Mm -hmm. in the New York Times and in European publications, which I think generated quite a lot of interest in that approach. Are you working on um, a media strategy that would reach that kind of an audience? Can you follow up with the reporter who did the Climate Fresk story to talk about this mm -hmm. program? Because the challenge is, of course, reaching so many campuses Another um, um, medium is the Chronicle of Higher Education. Sure. Uh, maybe work with something like that that has a huge, huge reach to raise awareness about the good work that you're doing. Well, thank you, Seth. And we are thinking about those. We have a media person who's uh, you know, doing some work in the space. Of course, we're a very small organization um, and we're relying on you really, right? There are you know, 60 people on this call. Um, and uh, we would ask all of you to reach out to the teachers you know, to the students you know, tell them about this project, get them excited about it. We hold these organizing calls every two weeks. Um, and um, we're glad to sort of guide anybody through this, through this process to get them engaged, get them involved. Uh, Seth mentioned Climate Fresk. It's a game. So that's also, we have a number of different games that uh, climate oriented games that you can pull into your climate week. Uh, we're, I've reached out to our, our chaplain and our rabbi. We're going to have a faith-based, uh, uh, conversations that week as well. Um, we'll be doing the theater here on campus. Um, films are always great. Uh, I would, I recommend how to blow up a pipeline, um, which is a fabulous movie. Um, uh, that sort of pushes students to think about the moment we're in, not a bullfrog film, but but a good one. So not hard to come up with a number of uh, interesting events which combine can pull in more than the usual suspects on campus. Um, uh, it's really finding those two or three people on a campus who are climate concerned, who are really looking for a way to, to elevate the conversation. You know, I, I think about this when I was in college in the early 80s, uh, you know, we actually didn't know yet about AIDS. AIDS was not a thing yet. But soon after I graduated, some of my friends started to die from AIDS. And some of you may remember that the climate, uh, that the, the AIDS activists had a, a saying, um, silence equals death, right? That was the AIDS activist slogan. Um, and it, it was really true, obviously. If you, if you didn't move beyond thinking of AIDS as a stigmatized disease, but instead you know, a public health problem, people were just going to continue to die of AIDS. And, and they were very successful. They got lots of people talking about AIDS um, and they they put, they put moved it beyond that. They got people all over the country engaged and, you know, cures were developed. And, you know, if you have access to medicine these days, AIDS is no longer a death sentence. And so, I mean, I think that climate silence is also equal to death. Right. As we know, if, if, if we don't push back against the, the oil industry narrative and the, the, the conventional dominant narrative that we we knew we, you know, we're hooked on oil, we can't get off of it, um, then we know what the consequences are going to be. I mean, we've already seen the impact of the hottest year on record with incredible record fires in Canada, six times the acreage uh, uh, of the past record burn this year. Um, exposing uh, people all over North America to deadly smoke. We ended with Lahaina fires. Last week, we had, you know, the the biggest Category 5 hurricane, the most powerful hurricane ever to hit the West Coast of the U.S., destroyed the city of Acapulco. Um, this would have been big news in any other news cycle, but it's essentially gotten swallowed up, disappeared. 
uh, the most expensive uh, a hurricane to hit Mexico ever. Um, and uh, the wind speeds in, in that hurricane were the, among the top five wind speeds ever recorded on the planet anywhere. Um, and so we know what 1.2 degrees C is doing to us. We have to figure out a way how to keep, you know, five years from now and 10 years from now, it being once again, the hottest year on the planet. Uh, that is the challenge we face. And we're excited about our platform. Um, we really feel like we've got a terrific, um, uh, scalable, accessible way uh, to energize climate concern staff, climate concern faculty, and climate concern students on campus to get everybody talking about it. Um, and um, I'm going to pause for a minute. Uh, and while we're still waiting for Bill, and I hope he'll be here, um, I'm going to introduce my colleagues, David Blockstein and Tobias Hess and Carrie Ann Canfield, uh, and see if any of them want to add anything to what I've said. Yeah, thank you, Evan. So, so this is David. Um, and thank you all for joining us as, as I'm looking at the names and faces here. Uh, old friends and, and uh, new uh, friends and collaborators. And I think that, you know, what we're doing at this point is really trying to scale up the conversation right now that has a a moment where the world, I mean, obviously we've got some really big and immediate uh, issues that are facing us uh, um, with with uh, wars uh, all over the place, but it's also a moment where we've recognized that uh, uh, most people are not only recognizing climate um, change is happening and that, um, in fact, many of them are um, experiencing, many of us are experiencing uh, varying degrees of climate despair. And so what we're really looking for your participation here is to help us to change young people, change ourselves as well from a state of climate despair to a state of climate repair. And so um, as, as Eben mentioned, there are really two ways that uh, we, we ask for your assistance. Um, one is to be organizing events. And even if you get, um, you know, the, the usual suspects for the most part, that's still really important that uh, I read an article the other day about preaching to the choir and the choir needs to be engaged too. The choir needs to be inspired and the, the choir needs to be boosted up by working together. But we also need to get uh, new singers with us. And so that's the idea of this make climate a class. And so our big goal is every teacher, every subject, every grade, every level of education, every educational institution, every community, every nation around the world. So obviously that's that's about a, as big a goal as we can have and we can add that to informal education as well, but we're never gonna make the changes that we need unless we all make a commitment to this. And so um, we celebrate you and, and thank you. And um, we wanna hear more about the things that you're doing and uh, the ideas that you have for, for what you've been what you've been doing already and, and how, how we can be working together. Um, I'm thinking what, uh, while we're still hopefully waiting for Bill, uh, I will share our website so we can give you a sense of some of the resources that we have available. Um, so pulling that up now. And um, this project is sponsored by the Open Society University Network, of which BARD is a, a co-lead. Um, and um, we've got uh, English, Spanish, French, Portuguese, Arabic versions of the website. Um, uh, uh, events don't have to happen on April between April 1st and 8th, although that is kind of the target week. Um, we've got a light, nice little one minute, uh, two minute in intro video there. Um, 
And, and here's the guts of the project, right? So this was last year's uh, sign up down here where you can see we had over 300 um, events all over the world, uh, 50,000 people, um, 60 countries. We need to double that, triple that this year. Um, and um, here are kind of the two options, uh, making climate an event. Oh, there's Bill making climate a class. So Bill will be joining us in just a minute. And before he gets here, let me say, I'm going to go to my faculty meeting this afternoon, and I'm going to talk to 200 BARD faculty, and I'm going to ask them all to make climate a class. Um, so I'm going to be making that personal appeal to our faculty um, in about an hour. And I'm, you know, I, I'm excited to have that conversation with them. Um, so uh, welcome, Bill. I'm glad you uh, were able to, to join us. Um, and I'll, let me give you a quick intro, and then we'll turn it over to you for five minutes. My apologies. Um, our, power, our power has been out, but our power has come back on. So all right. with... we're, you're fully empowered and you're going to empower us as well. So um, that's the plan. Uh, we're super excited to have Bill with us, a man who needs no introduction, uh, but, um, you know, I think has inspired so many of us over the last 30 years, um, beginning with uh, the end of nature. Uh, and, and and leading forward to to being you know the driving force one of the driving forces of the climate movement um, for the last twenty years or so. So, Bill, we were hoping you could just give us your thoughts on where we're at with this run up to COP, um, what the climate movement needs, um, and and then we'll do maybe Q and A for ten minutes if that works. Absolutely, for you. absolutely. Okay, um, so, hello, everybody, and many, many thanks. Um, these are people, many of you who've been working on this a long time, and it's good to be with you all, um, even especially. Um, look, I mean, you don't need me to tell you that 2023 is the year. Um, I mean, I feel like it's the year that I was writing about in 1989 when I wrote The End of Nature. Clearly, the world's climate has broken through to a new there's a new step change uh, uh underway right now and we're going into a much higher temperature regime on planet earth and that's very bad news um the, we've had um we've had the highest temperature for that date ever recorded for something like 115 straight days now globally around the world and at the hottest part of the year in June and July, we were having the hottest temperatures we think we've had on this planet for 125,000 years. So we're there, we're at 1.5 degrees now, um, uh, and, and we're beginning to see what that world looks like. And obviously what that world looks like is nothing good. Um, it's filled with pain and suffering for all kinds of people. And it's filled with increasingly a kind of series of feedback loops, i.e. those huge fires in Canada, so on, uh, that that are just the kind of repeating vicious cycles we most hope to avoid. Um, at the very same moment, 2023, and in, in a way that you could almost not script if you were, it would be too convenient, we're also seeing the finally the breakout of clean energy in a way that we haven't before. By midsummer, right at the point that we were getting those record all-time temperatures, we also hit the point where we were adding about a gigawatt of solar power around the world every day, um, i.e. a nuclear power plant's worth of solar power every day. And that's pretty much, you know, some place like where we need to be um, as a kind of basic ground, uh, uh, you know, to be to be headed in in some somewhat better direction. So this race is completely on, and the only question is how quickly we can. The question is not are we going to go to clean energy? Eventually, we will. Uh, it's so cheap that sheer economics will take us there over time, but. If it takes us 40 years to get there or even 20, then the world that we power on sun and wind will be a broken world. So the job is to speed up the downfall of dirty energy and speed up the adoption of clean energy as fast as we possibly can. You would think that that would be a politically obvious and easy task, but anything but uh, the fossil fuel industry remains incredibly strong. 
and they remain committed to the principle that their business model, which is basically we set things on fire, um, um, has to continue at least for a few more decades. That's why everything that they're doing is designed to maintain the combustion economy a little while longer. Uh, huge, you know, tax breaks for carbon capture schemes and hydrogen schemes and, uh, you know, the big switch to natural gas, which has been their calling card for a decade now and is underway in huge, huge ways. I don't know if people have been paying much attention, but I think over the last six weeks, we've seen the next great climate fight emerge. And it's all about uh, liquefied natural gas exports from the US. Uh, there weren't any until 2016. We're already the biggest uh, gas exporter around the world. If we continue at the pace that the industry wants and build the plants that they've proposed, by 2030, American natural gas exports will produce more greenhouse emissions than everything that happens in the European Union. Every house factory car from Greece to Finland will have less of an impact on the planet's climate than natural gas exports from the US. We now know from great work at um, even your New York State academic colleague, Bob Howarth's uh, shop up in Cornell, we know as of two weeks ago that natural gas exports are disastrously worse even than coal for their impact on the climate. So this is a huge battle to be had with the Biden administration, even at the moment that we desperately need to make sure that Donald Trump doesn't become president again, because we cannot waste another four years. We don't, we're literally out of years to waste. If there was a slogan to kind of uh, uh, motivate us, us at the moment, that would be mine. No more years to waste. Um, so that's where we are. Um, um, you know, there's a robust climate movement, but it's not big enough. Uh, we had 75,000 people on the march in New York City in August or September, uh, September, which was great, but that's considerably smaller than the 400,000 we had on the march in New York City in September of yeah. 2014. Um, you know, 350.org, which I started, is do doing its thing around the world, and now I've started this in case you run into any old people like me, we've started this thing called Third Act that's organizing people over the age of 60. And it's going great. We're building as fast as we possibly can. Um, but, but we need more because the basic schematic battle couldn't be simpler. The thing that will determine essentially how hot the planet gets is how fast can we turn off dirty energy and turn on clean energy? And if we can do it fast, then we can limit the warming perhaps to something that civilizations will be able to survive. And if we do it slowly, it's looking less and less likely that our planet will be able to deal with it in any way that we would recognize. That strikes me as the bottom line. I'm neither uh, optimistic nor pessimistic. I'm just engaged. And um, um, so, you know, on we go. That's five minutes, I think, and I'm, <laughs> I'll shut up now. <laughs> uh, well, Bill, let me start it off with um, why, you know, I would not have predicted that the climate marches would be smaller <laughs> rather than larger going forwards. What, what, is, what do you see as the, why aren't there, well, you know, why did we have a 400,000 person march 10 years ago and, and now we're at 75? Uh, the pandemic did a number on movements. Movements need to keep growing in certain ways. And that was right up until the moment of the pandemic. Its high point really was, you know, 10 million kids out on school strike in September of 2019. Yep. Um, and I think that the other side adapted and got better at spreading a series of comforting messages that were essentially lies and greenwashing uh, about that they were stepping up, that they were adopting net zero, this and that, on and on and on. Um, um, and the minute that the pressure was off, they really backtracked on most of those things. So we have no choice but to try and rebuild that movement. The thing that scares me, really, is that 
this year is coming and going with such extraordinary extreme temperatures, but it's not producing quite the reaction I would have predicted. Um, and there's, you know, obviously at the moment, there's some other things going on in our news that are grabbing people's attention and energy. Um, but we have to figure out how to make sure that, you know, we're, we're, we're in a different place on this soon. And I, I think, I hope that this uh, LNG fight may turn out to be one of the vehicles for doing that. Um, so those would be uh, similar to the Standing Rock kind of motivators, the pipeline battles of the of the last decade. Yep, maybe. I, I mean, I think Keystone's actually the closest analogy here because it's very mm -hmm. Washington centered okay. and nationalized from the start. All right. Well, um, so so we've got a few questions in the chat, um, which is how do you balance kind of the the overwhelming bad news on climate um, uh, and inspire young people in particular to, uh, yeah, to, to, to not be depressed, but to be, you know, engaged. Well, I think one one way you do that. Tobias, can you handle the mute there? Um, yeah. One way to do that is to focus on the extraordinary opportunity that we have right now around clean energy. Most people, huge majorities of all political persuasions love solar power, for instance. So making the point that we're now suddenly at a moment where the cheapest way to produce power on Earth is to point a sheet of glass at the sun, and that we really could imagine a world in quite short order where we stopped burning things on large scale and instead relied on the fact that the good Lord had hung a large ball of burning gas 93 million miles up in the sky, that's exciting. I mean, we can catch its rays on photovoltaic panels. We can take advantage of the fact that it differentially heats the earth, creating the breezes that turn those turbines. Um, and we have the batteries now to store it when the sun goes down or the wind drops. That's a fundamentally different world, one that works for public health, one that works for geopolitics, because everybody has sun and wind, uh, and one that works better for the climate. Um, so, you know, tell people. Uh, we're at the moment when we can um, start relying on energy from heaven instead of from hell. So uh, question, you, you, you mentioned that, you know, the other side has gotten good at sort of creating soothing messages. Uh, do, do you think that the, the challenge facing the climate movement is more that or more just a sense of this is unfixable and overwhelming and there's nothing I can do about it. And this is a question someone asked, is there a different sense from, you know, young people when you started 350 than today? Uh, are they in a different place? Well, I mean, I think young people are actually doing their job really well on this in a serious way. Um, but I, I do think that, that it, I think it takes everybody aback when they, it certainly did me when I was, you know, I wrote the first book about all this, and I think I expected then, I was in my 20s, that the world would begin to take action on it, because why wouldn't it? It's so clear and obvious, you know, whatever. Yeah. I think it does take people aback when they realize that there are very powerful forces in the world determined not to change, um, uh, to make sure we don't change. And sometimes, often, those forces win, you know, and that's mm -hmm. discouraging. Um, that's, you know, that's why we need to keep organizing and, and get some wins. And we're getting some. I mean, I think people should go and read Rebecca Solnit. I think she writes as well about this as anybody. Um, but I also think people should, I see one of the questions in the chat, and I think it's the central question really is, um, um, you know, what do you recommend as individual action? I don't recommend anything as individual action. I don't, I think we're a mile past the point where we can solve this thing one Tesla at a time. I'm glad I've got solar panels all over my roof and they connect to an EV in the garage, but I do not try to fool myself. That's how we're gonna do this. The most important thing an individual can do is be less of an individual and join together with others in movements large enough to make change happen. That's why we set up 350.org. That's why we set up Third Act. We need people moving out of their comfort zone. And you really can only do that and certainly only do it effectively if you're doing it in the company of others. 
That's a good note to, to end on, Bill, because we want to get back to this collective project that we're trying to move as educators. Um, so for the Even, folks... Even, yeah, sir, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. I think we have a couple of questions about the student mood and, and uh, combating climate despair. And I'd, 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 I'd like okay. to give Bill a chance to, to, to talk about that. Please. You know, it's just a certain sense in which I'm the wrong person to ask because I, I mean, the cheerful title for the first book I wrote about all this 35 years ago was The End of Nature, you know. Um, uh, I completely understand climate despair and anxiety. And I, I find the only, I mean, in my personal life, the only effective uh, uh, sort of daily anecdote is uh, to get out and be in the natural world sometimes as much as I can. And I find by far the most important antidote is action. Effective action has some chance of um, taking that um, despair and uh, making at the very least turning it into a certain amount of anger, which is more useful and I think more psychologically useful. There are days when I get up and I'm not at all convinced that whatever I'm working on is <clears throat> going to solve the problem, but I console myself with thinking, at least I'm making life harder for Exxon today. And there are days when that has to be enough, um, um, you know, um, and, and the only other thing I'd say that's good about movements is when there's a lot of people, you're working with a lot of people, there are moments when if you need to tap out for a while, you can, um, and mm -hmm. other people will tap in for you. So I'm really grateful for the work that everybody's doing there. Um, thank you all enormously. And um, and um, we will see. I mean, the interesting thing about it all is we don't know the outcome, but we will know the outcome in the relatively near future. The IPCC says we have six years to cut emissions in half. Uh, that's on the bleeding edge of the technically possible. Uh, it's gonna require a huge shove to the system to make anything like that happen. So let's give it a huge shove. And, you know, if we meet back in six years and it's all, um, you know, uh, uh, we didn't do it, then we can reconsider and see if it's time to put our feet up on the porch railing and, you know, uh, drink whiskey instead. Um, um, but for the moment, we've got serious work to do. We have to do it together. It has to be as effective and pointed as is possible. That's, that's all I got. There was a question in there about effectiveness of climate movements, and uh, I think maybe the last time I saw you in person, Bill, was at the, uh, the, was it the 2012 uh, mass arrest in Washington, D.C., or, uh, where we got Obama to uh, pull, the pi uh, pull the permit for the Keystone Pipeline. And um, with great activism over the rest of the decade, that project never got built. Keep your calendars um, free for January. I think we may have to do something sort of like that in DC around this LNG stuff. So all right, when this round comes around, <laughs> we will see. Well, I, I, I told them I'd get arrested every 25 years. So maybe, but maybe I'll have to reduce that down to 10. You better cut it down um, to a decade anyway, you know? Yes, yeah, decade. You know, better um, practice. All right. All right. So thank you, Bill. And that gives us a great segue back into activism um, and engagement. Thirdact.org, of course, is a plate great uh, organization for those of us over 60. Um, but uh, this is more of a multi-generational initiative that we've got going on here. Um, so, uh, you know, once again, I would say, you know, what can each of you do? Everybody knows a teacher. Everybody knows a climate concerned teacher. Everybody knows a climate concerned student. Reach out to them today uh, or tomorrow, one-on-one, -on -one, kind of good old fashioned community organizing. Tell them about uh, the Worldwide uh, Climate Education Week. And uh, Tobias can drop our, our link in the chat. Oh, there it is, uh, worldwideclimateed.org. Um, and then we can work with them to get their schools involved. And I was saying that, you know, this afternoon, I'm gonna go talk to 200, you know, faculty members at Bard, and I'm gonna ask them all to make climate a class. I'm gonna ask them to take, you know, they don't teach climate change, they teach whatever, you know, geometry or um, philosophy 101. I'm gonna say, take 30 minutes in your class, the first week of April, and talk about how philosophers and mathematicians are thinking about climate change so that we can get our students talking and thinking about climate change from you know, 30 different 
interdisciplinary perspectives, right? And I'm going to tell the faculty that if we get 50 faculty members talking to 20 students each, that's a thousand students, right? Engaged in really compelling and interesting intellectual conversations about how to fix the climate. Um, and if all 50 of those faculty do it in all four of their classes, that's 4,000 students engaged in conversation. So this is a very powerful lever, this kind of make climate a class opportunity um, to, to really spread the message. And from an organizer's point of view, we have all of these teachers who really are worried about climate change for their own personal families, right? Not to mention their students. They're in despair. Give them something to do. You know, empower them to to bring this into their classroom. Um, so, you know, again, those are the uh, sort of pieces that we have in play. Um, and I was just sharing our our website. Maybe I'll go back to that. Um, Tobias, and um, even while, while you're doing maybe, that, let, let me yeah. just say our hypothesis with this is that even though thirty minutes doesn't sound like much and it isn't uh, given the scale of what's ahead of us that if we can get every educator into the tent of teaching about climate change climate solutions climate justice in the context of what they do that their students are going to see that there's a way that they can be engaged regardless of their skills and interests and the teachers are going to see that they have a lot of interest from their students. The students are actually more engaged than when they um, talk about their subject in other ways. And that, in fact, um, they're going to be encouraged to do more. And that's how, um, you know, even within this uh, um, world of uh, education that uh, we can build this collective action, this movement that, that Bill McKibben was talking about. Sorry, even go ahead. Yeah, just again, here's here's our map from last year. We want to double, triple these numbers. Um, and there's an opportunity, if you go to our website, you can sign up right away. If you're a teacher who's going to do this, you just go to Pledge to Make Climate a Class. It'll take you to this page and you just let us know you're going to do it. That's a great thing to do. Um, and uh, also significantly, if you uh, are going to do an event, you're going to make climate an event on your campus. This is where where the, the flags on the map really start to show up, and you can see we're getting started um, with folks signing up. Um, and here's the interactive map. Um, so we need to fill this map up again. You just click right here. You don't have to today know what you're going to do um, at your school. You just that you're going to be the person who's going to take the lead. That's really what the commitment you're making by signing up. And somehow our map's not really loading, but, um, you know, it's click to host. That's right here. Um, let us let us know that you're going to be part of the day by signing up. So those are the two ways you can sign into this project and let us know you're going to be part of it. Um, yeah, uh, uh, I guess, Seth, you have your hand up. You want to add something? Yeah, following up also on McKibben's comments about we need to re-energize the movement. How can can your program, can this program have a political action component in the way of during the week of April? And I'm of course, you know, biased by what's happening in the United States, but this is happening all over the world. But during the week of April 1st, also talk about taking action from the perspective of political action. Yeah, this is all determined locally. So there's, you know, we've got people operating, as you know, in Kyrgyzstan and Bangladesh and, and Colombia. And so we're, we can't really uh, prescribe any particular political action, but obviously organizers can make that central or not to the kind of education that they're doing on the ground. Um, right. And we, we've and, thought and about we've some sort of unifying global statement, but we haven't really done that. And this is a platform, right? This is really a, a just, just an opportunity for people to do what they want in collaboration with others because we are stronger together. And we've had a bunch of interesting things come out of our different teachings. Yeah. yeah. I, 
I would also say we that part of the, the timing for this, the, the first week in April, is to start Earth Month because Earth Day is really morphing into Earth Month. And so among our principal partners is the Earth Day organization. So our approach is to be starting the month with education and then by Earth Day and beyond uh, building to, to action. Yeah, if you could do something to proactively connect the two, because there's no course yeah. political activism in the in the schools, in the classes. Um, so yeah. it's not something that the teachers are going to feel comfortable doing. Right. But if you can connect to Earth Month and the political action stuff, I think that would be a great way to help the students see what they can do. Mm -hmm. Well, I think all any event should be solutions focused, right? right? So if you're going to be, you know, this is not the make climate a class is less about sort of solutions. It's really more about how historians are dealing with this, how psychologists are dealing with this, how, you know, pre lawyers and pre-law classes are dealing with this, get students intellectually incited and engaged. And we can't ask teachers to talk about solutions, right? Um, but if you're organizing a campus event, then you can absolutely talk about solutions, right? You can show you know, how to blow up a pipeline as, you know, direct action being one solution, one way to get involved, right? Nonviolent or non, you know, uh, nonviolent in the sense of, of people. Um, you know, you can uh, bring on to campus uh, people who are, um, you know, organizing around uh, climate legislation. You can bring to campus, you know, entrepreneurs who are starting businesses. So you can, uh, you know, create career fairs that show students lots of pathways into climate work so you know they should absolutely be very kind of hands-on what can i do sort of opportunities um on at your when you make climate an event thanks yeah we have just a few more minutes um do we have any other questions for the organizers here you've got the four of us here the team um, annalise yeah, even Annalise would like to say a couple of things about teaching green Italian as an example of how to teach in a, a subject area that uh, people wouldn't necessarily think about as, as climate related. Annalise, you want Fabulous. to share a couple moments there, please? Yeah, um, so I, I taught green Italian at UBC for probably only eight, nine years. Um, I just want to say that I think you can incorporate action to to a certain extent um, because not only did we do um, we did farm field trips because um, UBC happens to have an amazing uh, organic farm that you know we also had to fight to keep, um, but you can you can um, put your your assignments and compositions and so on through the lens of sustainability. I, I over the years managed to do that with more and more things. Um, I was able to incorporate the whole slow food movement because that's Italian. Um, and I had my students do presentations, read books and watch movies in English, but then do presentations in Italian on, you know, movies and books that had to do with this. And in terms of action, you know, their final assignment was in Mio Piano Verde, my green plan. And, um, you know, they had to speak to what, how their life might look a little different than they thought because of things they'd been learning in the course. Um, most students love this. Um, and if you can do it with Italian, you can do it. <laughs> in any subject, believe me. Um, my, uh, the head of the department loved it. The problem was towards the end, we got a new acting head who told me to take all the sustainability out of my courses, which mm. I refused to do. <laughs> um, however, I was, you know, reaching retirement age and it was like that just sort of took the joy out of it. So I taught for another year um, and, so one of my points is my colleagues loved what I was doing, thought, oh, this sounds so great. But once I retired, that just disappeared. There's no green Italian anymore. There's no green French in the department. There's no green Spanish. 
Um, so it's really- well, I think this, this really speaks to leadership, right? Mm -hmm. And the idea of stepping up. Um, often you will find administrators who are supportive of this. Sometimes you find administrators who are in opposition. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, we're not asking people to create a whole new class um, in Green Italian. We're really asking people just to spend a half an hour talking about issues in Italian, in Green, or Spanish, or French. Um, it's very easy to make a, a, a French class or a Spanish class uh, a Green class. Uh, a climate class, because of, all you have to do is focus on events that are happening in those countries um, in the language of choice. Um, so yeah, at least as a starting it. point, that's what we're looking for. Yeah. And use it as a lens, see where you can incorporate it. Mm -hmm. And and I, and I really encourage all of you who are teaching to do this because, you know, I don't do any of that anymore. I now write climate fiction for young mm -hmm. adults. Um, and that's where I need to focus myself. But we all need to do this where we are right now. Yeah. We actually have terrific resources on our website for folks that do want to devote like more substantive kind of uh, uh, chunks of their curricula to, um, to climate issues. Uh, we have a partnership with an organization called um, uh, Subject to Climate. Um, and if you go to our resources page, you can see <clears throat> uh, the ways that you can get involved here. Here's Subject to Climate, which is one of our major uh, kind of content partners. And they actually have got um, uh, lesson plans um, uh, in uh, virtually every subject. That's why it's called Subject to Climate uh, for K-12 and also um, college age students. So uh, it's it's sort of a... a uh, the next step beyond kind of the 30 minute make climate a class. Um, I will add as well that we're, we have a speakers bureau. Um, uh, and if you'd like to join the speakers bureau, we would welcome that. Um, so we're really trying to make it easy for people to have a guest speaker in their class. If they're in economics or if they're in political science or if they're in chemistry or if they're in anthropology or history who can speak to how the discipline is being impacted by, by climate and, and justice. So, um, we will send out to you in a follow-up email links to uh, that um, Speakers Bureau. Uh, we're, we're adding names to that daily so we can provide that resource to teachers around the world so you can pop in for a virtual appearance in a course in uh, Bulgaria or in Ghana um, and talk about some of these issues with students. It's quite fun and interesting for people with expertise. Um, so, uh, I guess just circling back to kind of what you can do, um, you know, if you are a teacher today, pledge to make climate a class. That's simple. Um, if you're at a school, please today, pledge to be involved, pledge to make climate an event. Um, and again, you don't need to know what it's gonna be yet. We got lots of opportunities just saying, yes, we're gonna put a flag on the map for UBC or whatever college. So we know they're gonna be participating. Um, do reach out to teachers you know, to students you know, tell them they need to be a part of this, that together we can engage thousands of schools, hundreds of thousands of students, um, and uh, and really get everybody talking about climate because climate silence equals death. Um, any other comments, David uh, or Tobias or Carrie Ann, you guys wanna add? Yes, I just add. I mean, there's there's a lot of a lot of conversation going on in in the chat, and it's it, I can't keep up with all of it, but it's exciting just to hear what what everybody is doing. And you know, I I guess you know what the one thing I would say about our collective action here with the um, Climate and Justice Education Week is that it's it's all. Um, locally generated, locally controlled. You know, we're not telling you what to do. We have uh, great resources such as uh, Winnie from Bullfrog Films is going to be providing um, screenings of, of uh, their films and uh, some other filmmakers are providing uh, screenings and curriculum guides. So we have lots of things um, that you can be doing and, um, you know, Register, 
get in our system if you're not already share with everybody else and uh, um you know we're going to keep having these uh, conversations uh, regularly uh, on on Wednesdays um we'll we'll keep you posted on the schedule next week we're having a uh, a group that um coming out of Europe that's organized something called the week and it's a week long um experience uh, three hour-long screenings followed by 30-minute discussions of films that are um, in, in, in or they're structured to bring in people to the climate conversation that maybe aren't talking about it. And it's, it's an exciting thing and I wanna learn more about it. And so as you have these ideas, you know, please share it with us. Um, I put my email in the chat a couple of times. Um, you know, register your event and share or or your activity and share what you're doing. And this is how we we will build this uh, community that uh, um, the Bill McKibben is talking about and that is making a difference. So thank and, you and all just, for I, being with I, us. I, I want to just close on that. I mean, you know, in 2014, we had 400,000 people in the streets in New York. You know, last month we had 75,000. We need to get back up to 400,000 and beyond, right? And so we need to get students moving out of this mindset of climate despair into a real mindset of climate repair, right? We've done a lot of damage to the climate, a lot of repair work to be done. We all need to be part of that. So the only way to do that is to get them talking about it on, on campus again, right? That has got to happen. Um, and, um, and the only way for that to happen is for each of you to reach out to those four or five climate concerned teachers you knew and lean on them. You know, this is old fashioned community organizing. I get 40 emails a day asking me to give money or time or do this or do that. And I delete them, obviously I can't pay attention to them all. Um, but the personal engagement, the I'd love to have a conversation or this is really important with somebody you know that is actually the way that we build a movement. So you do take the time, don't just forward the email, reach out to people and say, this is something you really need to do. Um, this is something you really need to be involved with. And we're glad to support, engage, you know, and help people move this project forward. So thanks everybody and have a good week um, and talk to somebody about climate change and, and the Worldwide Climate and Justice Education Week. Thanks for yeah, being we'll here. Be in touch, hey everyone. Uh, we'll be in touch after with all these links to sign up, all the climate ed resources. We really appreciate your time and energy. And thanks again for bearing with us. Um, we we really appreciate your time today. Great we'll to have you here. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.